worried about this. There's going to be child care. There'll be free parking. All right, there it is. Uh, there's going to be giveaways, and we're really excited about this opportunity to reach out to our community and to continue to spread the gospel message, and that's what it's about. Um, okay, that's not working. Uh, we have other things that are happening. If you go to the, uh, this evening, uh, the Acrofest is going to be happening. Uh, look for when that is. I'm not quite sure. There is another baby shower. I just want you to know, whenever we have children's story, when we have 50 to 60 kids up here, that is a huge blessing for our church. And I don't, I don't know if you realize that, because if you go to other churches, uh, sometimes their children's stories are much smaller. Attended. And we, we love even the, the, the one little children, child, but that means there's potential here. Uh, we have young families, and we are going out with the commission of being fruitful and multiplying, and that is beautiful. And so this baby shower is coming up to Brooklyn Miller on Sunday, February 4 at 9.30 in the fellowship. Please RSVP to Carrie Bell. Her number is in the bulletin. And uh, Brooklyn, uh, not just Brooklyn, Brooklyn and her husband is also, where, where are they? They are somewhere. Brian, is, oh, there they are. Brian, you are also registered at Amazon for the baby gift. So we just want to encourage you to those things. This next week is the first uh, Sabbath of the the. Uh, excuse me, not the first Sabbath. This next week is the first Thursday of the month. And, and with that being said, the Ladies Thrive Group is going to be meeting at 7 p.m. And then on Wednesday night is the normal Bible studies, 5.30. The Ladies Bible Study, 7 p.m. at the Men's Bible Study. And then Thursday night is going to be the Ladies Thrive Group. So we just encourage those ladies that are in, uh, interested in that to come out to that wonderful small group, uh, support group. That's Thursday at 7. There's much more announcements that are put into the uh, bulletin as well as in the newsletter. If you don't already subscribe, please do so. But at this time, please stand for opening prayer and then remain standing for our opening hymn. Let's pray. Father God, we just, we are in awe of you. Every opportunity, as the psalm says, to, to sing, to praise you, to lift our voices heavenward. And Lord, as the Psalms does say also, is blessed are you, God Almighty, for you are the maker of heaven and earth. And so we join with those that have come before and say amen and amen as we join together. Send your Holy Spirit with us, on us today as we open your word, as we sing, as we pray, and as we hear your voice is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing for opening hymn.
can be seated. It's a blessing to be here this morning, isn't it? In God's house. Our offering this morning is, uh, it's, uh, let me check the bulletin, Kentucky, Tennessee, Advance. And I think most of you all know that that is for uh, Highland Academy, Madison Academy, Indian Creek Camp, and I believe some of that goes to evangelism too. And um, I tell you, it's, it's, it's such a privilege and a blessing to be able to bless other people with our, with our gifts, isn't it? God is taking care of us. And um, I'll remind everyone that we don't take up the offering, so there is a box in the lobby, and you can go online under Highland um, Church in Portland, and you can give that way, or you can come by the church, and the offices are open uh, during the week. Let's pray together. Father, we give you this offering, and with it, we give you our worship. And we also give you our whole selves this morning. Please take us, take it, take this offering and use it for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. Now, Mr. Tom here will come up and have our children's story. And uh, children, if y'all would like to come up and meet right up here in front. And um, I think you're also collecting money. Oh, you're, oh, you're giving that, you're giving that. You guys were so generous this morning that they had trouble carrying it all up. Morning, boys and girls. How are you this morning? Good. You know, it looks a little different outside today than it did last Sabbath, doesn't it? What color was it outside last Sabbath? White. Everywhere, wasn't it? And today, what color is it outside? Brown. It was pretty last Sabbath, but I like the temperature better today, so glad you guys are here this morning. I have a, a little story to tell you. Um, it's a story from when I was a boy, just a little bit older than you are, but actually pretty close. I think I probably would have had to have been around uh, 10 years old. Um, we lived in the country, and we had a dog that we had uh, rescued from the kennel. It was a dog that, that we don't know for sure. Maybe it had run away. Maybe somebody just couldn't keep it. 
And uh, so it had been turned into this uh, kennel close by to where we lived. And we had actually been looking for a dog like this. And uh, one day, I remember my dad brought this dog home and it was a big black and brown dog and it was a German Shepherd. Do you know what a German Shepherd looks like? They're kind of like the dogs that you see a lot of police officers have. They have the real pointy ears and they're a big dog and a lot of people actually get German Shepherds to keep at their houses and in their yards to protect them. They're a very protective dog. So we got this German Shepherd and true to his nature, this dog was very protective. In fact, this dog was so protective of my brother and myself that when we would get into wrestling matches with my dad, because we like to wrestle and play once in a while, if we would get, in, get into wrestling matches with my dad, sometimes the dog would growl at my dad. Like that's how protective this dog was of my brother and I. So one day, uh, I had a friend over from the neighborhood and we were playing tag. Do you like to play tag? I really like to play tag as well. And especially at 10, I like to play tag. And we had all kinds of fun stuff to play tag with. We had um, tall metal fences that we could climb over and go under. We had a barn that we could run around. Well, one day when my friend was over, we were playing tag. And he was it. And he was chasing me through the yard, and I could tell that he was getting closer to me which meant that I was gonna get caught pretty soon. So I had this idea. Remember our protective German Shepherd? He was chained outside the house by the barn, okay? Now, before I get to the next part of the story, how many of you know what your conscience is? Anybody? Few of you, what is your conscience? Anybody willing to share what you think it is? No, but you know what it is, right? It's something that speaks to you from inside, right? It's designed to help you know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes it speaks to you before you make a decision, and sometimes it speaks to you after you've made a decision, right? You know, I like to believe that the conscience is God's way of instructing us but we have to be willing to listen to it. Well, I was right in the middle of chase, and I was not listening to it very well. My friend was gaining ground on me, and I was running as fast as I could, and I saw where our dog was tied up. Prince was his name. I said, you know what? I'm going to run right through where Prince is tied up, and I think that Jeff, he was the boy that was chasing me, I think that Jeff will be afraid to chase me through there, and so I could probably get away if I cut right through there. Well, apparently Jeff was in the moment of chase as well, and he didn't think that he should go around. He thought he should cut right through with me because he was going to catch me. About halfway through, the dog saw someone chasing me and decided that he better act quickly. So guess what the dog did? There were now two of us getting chased. I was getting chased by Jeff, and Jeff was getting chased by our dog. Who's quicker? Our dog was. And you know what it did? It bit him right on the bottom. I turned around because I heard the dog and I heard its chain coming across the ground, so I knew it was running. And I turned around just in time to see it open its mouth and grab his behind. As a kid, I kind of thought it was funny. Okay? And I just kept running. But when I heard Jeff scream, I realized that it probably wasn't very funny anymore, especially for Jeff. Now, we're very lucky that he was able to keep his momentum and get through there, 
but he had a big rip in his pants and he actually had a, a bite injury on his leg where the dog had bit him. We were lucky that that's all that happened. I had a very stern talking to from my parents and we had a visit with Jeff's parents as well because of what had happened. Fortunately, it was not a serious injury, but it was entirely my fault because I didn't take time to listen to my conscience. I thought about this story a little bit this week, and I thought about all of the good stories in the Bible about people that some of them who listened to their conscience and some of them who did not, and the things that happened to them because of the choices they made. And I wanted to leave you with just a quick positive story about someone that listened to their conscience. Do you remember the story about the little boy who went to hear Jesus speak and everybody got really hungry? How many of those people had food with them? Not very many, right? But this little boy had some loaves and fishes. What do you think his conscience was telling him that day when he saw that people were hungry and that Jesus was looking for food? His conscience inspired him to share his food, right? Now, by nature, we're not very sharing sometimes with the things that we have. But his conscience spoke to him, and he was willing to give the little bit of food that he had so that other people could eat. And because of that, we saw an entire miracle take place for a big group of people. So I want to encourage you, when you hear that little voice in your head telling you what you should and what you shouldn't do, you need to pay very close attention to it. And when you've made a mistake and your conscience speaks to you, oftentimes you will know what the right thing is to do to make up for the mistake that you've made. And Jesus is more than willing to forgive us for our mistakes. It's a good thing because we keep making them over and over. But God doesn't forget about us because we make mistakes. He loves us just the same he uses our conscience to help us make better choices next time. So this next week, when you have all kinds of different choices to make about being obedient and being kind, allow God to speak to you through your conscience. That's his voice. Even though it's soft, listen to it. You guys have a good Sabbath. church family. I was asked to lead in some praise songs and you know I love the praise songs that we sing especially with the young people and sometimes with the guitars but there are a lot of praise songs that we sometimes forget about and I think of some of the ones when I was in college that we used to sing and play with the guitars but then I also remember there are some really beautiful praise songs in our, our hymnal. And this morning I'd like to sing a couple praise songs out of our hymnal. And uh, again, you know, the praise worship is really what? About us? No, it's about Jesus. And so the first song that we'd like to sing in our praise this morning, and if you'd like to use the hymnals, I'd like to see them come back out again. Uh, 499, what a friend we have in Jesus.
I don't know about you, but I have a great hope. When I see what's going on in the world today, you know, it could easily become fearful, and there are a lot of people who are. But I have a hope in Jesus, and that hope is, gives me strength every day, and I'm excited about the fact that we're that much closer to Jesus coming. We have this hope, 214. We have this hope that times for our care song and bring in our care uh, cards up to put in the Bible this morning and uh, if we could kneel those of us that are staying in place we'll start this time Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We are so thankful for you, Father. We want to praise your name. We are thankful for everything that you do for us. You are everything that is good. Father, I ask, I thank you most of all for Jesus, your son. Father, I ask you to please be with those that are, that are sick and are, are hurting this morning. There's so much sickness going on right now in our area. Father, especially be with Miss Emma Wortham. Please help her with her heart issue that's going on right now. Please bless her and heal her. Please be with Pastor Steve uh, and help him with his illness as well. And be with all the others that are hurting. Please be with, please send your, please be with Pastor ben, Benji this morning as he delivers his message. Please send your Holy Spirit that everyone here may hear and may learn more about you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Genesis. Uh, Chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And may the Lord uh, add a blessing to his reading and hearing of his word. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that it creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. 
he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Psalms, Psalms chapter 8, Psalms chapter 8, and I'll be reading from the ESV this morning, verse 3. We have been going through uh, the book of Genesis, uh, actually not the book, we've been going for, through the first two chapters of Genesis, and I don't know if you've noticed a pattern, um, but somebody caught it on their way out, they said, thank you for going through our Adventist fundamental beliefs. I was like, oh, you caught on. Um, one thing that I strongly believe is that Genesis 1 to 11 actually in incorp incorporates almost all of our fundamental beliefs in the very beginning. And, and what, I, what I believe and where I land with the biblical narrative is that the Bible writers under the guide of the Holy Spirit are looking at Genesis 1 through 11 and those patterns that are formed there will then echo throughout the rest of Scripture. And you will see these patterns going in and out and, 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 and being played with and, and, and meditated on as, as they're unpacking. And by the time we get to 
Revelation, it is on full bloom. Like John the Revelator is totally, and I'm going to use this word, geeking out on Genesis 1 to 11 and geeking out on what we call the Old Testament. He's geeking, out, he's geeking out on the Tanakh. He is just fully enthralled as the Holy Spirit leads him to understand what's happening at the end actually looks very similar to what happened at the beginning. And so if, if you understand that, Jesus did it too. He says, as we're in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Again, it is a pattern that's repeated over and over again. And I think as we sit in this and as we meditate on it, I think there are some beautiful things that we can take from this that speak to today's things that are happening. Because while I I can't imagine Genesis 1 authors, Moses, and, and, you know, having what's happening now on his mind, but you look around and there is this question that is being asked in, in today's society, but I think all along has been this question is... What is the meaning of life? And what is mankind? Like, what is the purpose of mankind? What are we to do? Whether you're a humanist or you're a creationist, the question is, what is this? What is this about? What, what, what are you, whether you believe in evolution, which is obviously we do not believe in, the question is, what, what are you to do with that? And the question is, we as Christians ask is, in, in God creating us, what are we created for? And so all of us get to that question one way or another is, what is mankind? And the psalmist here in, in Psalms 8 has creation on his brain, and he repeats, and I'm not just making this up, he repeats some phrases that are actually in Genesis that we've read or are going to read some more this morning. And here in Genesis, excuse me, in Psalms 8, verse 3, Psalms 8, verse 3, David is meditating about the creation of God, and he says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars you have set in place. And here's the question. What is mankind, what is man that you are mindful of him? Like if we are, if you didn't catch my sermon last week, uh, go back and watch it online. But it's it's the fact if we are created out of dust and, and that you breathed into us the breath of life, that animating, that is exactly the same that animals that are created as dust and that have breathed into the breath of life, what are we? What is mankind then? He says, in the son of man that you care for him. Yet, you have made him, and here is, here is like the point of today's sermon. If you miss it, uh, if you decide to leave or whatever, and you're not quite sure, here is the whole point of, of today's sermon is what has God called us as mankind to? And David says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Like, when did he crown us with glory and honor? David is just meditating on this. And he says, you have given him, and here it is, this is like, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, O Yahweh, O Yahweh, our Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What is mankind? What makes us special that even though we're created from dust and we have the breath of life in us, what makes us different than the animals? It's because God said, and he blessed us, and he appointed all things under our feet. 
But what does that mean when we go, turn in the Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, what, what does it mean when Scripture says, and so eloquently is inserted this, this little poem here in, 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 in verse 26 of chapter 1, then God said, let us make man in our, and, and by the way, there is, there is so much here, I can't do it justice. And so I just encourage you to go back and meditate on these yourself. I can't cover every topic in Genesis 1 that is being laid down. If I did, you guys would get bored of me, and you may already be bored of Genesis. But, but here is the, the, the point. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and everything that creeping, that thing that creeps on the earth. And you can hear the imagery that David is playing with in Psalms. He's, he's meditating on this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And, and thus begins the story of mankind. And I don't want you to miss it here because here in Genesis chapter 1, it starts to play with words and you're like, wait, what's going on? He created him, male and female. And you're like, wait a minute. Like what? No, no, no. In, in, in God's wisdom, he's doing something. Now, I, I thought since we're going back to the very beginning of Genesis, I thought it fitting that you go back to the, the, the close to the very beginning of my family. Here on the screen is Benjamin, who's now 21. He's in, in Indonesia right now being a student missionary, teaching in one of the Adventist schools. But please don't judge the Adventist health message that is on the screen right now. Um, I, I am in no way condoning this behavior. However... My wife walked in on Benjamin and I sitting in bed, me with my, my wonderful can of, I don't even know what that is, a rolled gold snack mix, it's pretzels and um, fake cheese or whatever, uh, and there is my son with his favorite animal crackers. And notice they're the Sam Club, Sam's Club's version of that because we believe in portion control. And so here, here we are, just sitting there, and my wife walked in and laughed at us, and she's like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, what? You know, when, when, when Cartini and I found out we were pregnant, and we, we looked at the ultrasound on the screen, even though we understand the scientific process of what's happening, it still was like, that's, that's what we created? Like, that's... That's going to be a human being. It's like this thing on the screen that just looks like, and they're like, oh, look at this. Look at the heartbeat. I'm like, I don't know. It just looks like black thing on the screen. And they have 3D ones now and colored ones, but we didn't want to pay for that. So we got the weird one that's, you know, just the normal one. And, and you can't hardly tell anything. And we're like, that's, that's what we, look, look what we made, this thing. And then when he came out, because you're never sure what they're going to look like when they, when they come out. They, they look different. Benjamin, Benjamin, bless his heart, had like, he was the hairiest baby I'd ever seen in my life. He had, they call it womb hair. I didn't know what that was. And like he had hair all, he was a preemie. He was premature about a, uh, four weeks. And he came out and he was hairy. And, and I was like, is that going to stay? Like, because that's a lot of body hair. And, and I thought to myself, like, is he the image of us? Like, like as, he, as we begin to grow, like, he's, you started to see, like, oh, oh, he has, he has your nose, people would say, or, or your ears. And I'm like, please don't say he has my body hair. Because like, you just, you look at this and you're like, people, and, and they're like, it's two months old three months old, six months old, and, and as all of a sudden it started to take, as he, it, as he took shape, you begin to see flashes of Cartini or flashes of Benji. And in, when Cartini walked in, you see, you see moments where he looks like me, behaves like me, and actually 
is in the image of me. You see, he's not me. Benjamin is a blend of, praise God, Cartini and myself. And so when, when you look at that picture, you're like, yes, I see you as your son. But when you look at this picture of, of my son and my wife, you're like, oh, he's got an Indonesian nose. He's, he's got that nice darker complexion. Like in the summer, he, he, he gets even darker than my wife. And, and there's me who's like transparent. And, and, and it was interesting because, you know, as he gets older and depending on you know, if he's angry or if he's sad or mad, his eye color actually changes. And so sometimes it's like my eye colors and sometimes it's, it's like my wife's eye color. But, but, but do you see what I'm saying here? That, that, that while Benjamin is his own being, he has things that make him the image of us. So, so the question is, what does it mean to be created in the image of God, male and female? What, what did they mean? What do we mean? And, and again, I, I just want you to sit this morning, and I don't have time to get into all of it. I'm just going gonna, gonna to touch on a couple of things. But the first thing is this idea of the image. What does it be, mean to be the image of God? Because here's the thing, that, that term image is going to be riffed off of all the way through the Old Testament, actually into the New Testament, actually into John, the revelator, begins to talk about the image of the beast. And it's, it's, it's no small note that, that one of the commandments of God, in fact, one of the first ones, is that you shall not make any image of God. And, and the question you need to ask yourself is why? And some of you may be saying, well, because God doesn't, you know, he's up there, he wants us to worship it. Like, we are, we are not to worship the image and that stuff. And that's true. You shall worship the Lord your God and only he. The, the Bible is very clear on that. But, but you have to understand that, that the, the Ten Commandments is totally riffing on the idea of why we're not to create a, an image of him is because we already are. We are his image. There doesn't need to be any more. God created in his image, male and female, and God said it was good. Don't miss this point because over and over again, the, the Old Testament chastises Israel for being God's image bearers and behaving like the pagans, treating each other. Because here's the thing, if, if the male is created in the image of God and the female is in the created in the image of God, there is no other category. And I am to treat the other as the image bearer of God. That no matter what I think of them, that I must first realize from the very beginning, from the moment God bent down and, and started to play with the Play-Doh, the dust, God's intention was to create an image bearer of him as a placeholder, as a go-between, as an intercessory, for him. And, and so in this text, when it says, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, we, we then ask our question, what are these three main categories? How are we, how are we, how is Benjamin, how is he created in the image of me, but understanding he's not me? An image is not the thing it is imaged of. Do you like that? That's Deep Thoughts by Benji Maxson. Three main categories are, are, I think, we can acknowledge. External representation, inner quality, or ethical responsibility. And all three, I think, we can understand that even though the scriptures use anthropomorphism, excuse me, in other words, that's an easy word for me to say as I had a hard time. The Bible says God had a beard and, and, and all of this. 
But the Bible also says God is an all-consuming fire. In other words, there are times the Bible writers are brought in and, and God portrays himself as humanity. There's, there's some interesting scholar, well, never mind. You can come to the Bible study if you want to know more about that. But, but as, as God deals with this idea of who he is and reveals himself, to limit God to human features, I think, falls short of what the biblical narrative is trying to get at. That God is, is an all-consuming light. He's an all-consuming fire. It, 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 over and over again, Scripture has this, this un, unintelligible, un, untangible view of God. But at times shows him in a tangible way. And so the three main categories we must understand is that when we are created in his image, what responsibility are we to take as his image bearer? And what does that look like? Because here in Genesis, we, we've got this story. And then let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of the time this, this morning mostly with this idea of what God did. The, the Lord God, chapter 2, verse 15, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. And by the way, just a note, the work and keep idea, you'll find that language all throughout Leviticus and Numbers with dealing with what the priests were supposed to do with the, t the tabernacle. It's the exact same language, that the priests were work and keep the tabernacle. That what man is doing in the garden, this is a priestly role that then gets echoed out through, through the Levitical system, which, by the way, Jesus then comes and fulfills ultimately as the high priest. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree of garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. You shall surely die. And here it is, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to man to see what he would call them. But as we read quickly, we can, we can sit there and understand that this is a second retelling of this, that Genesis 1 is, a, is an overview, and now, now it's an enclosed shot here, Genesis 2, and it gets into the nitty-gritty. But even in the nitty-gritty, th that God is actually dropping some things in there to help us understand what it means to be an image bearer of God. Because here's the thing, the singular human being is created as a plurality, male and female, in a similar way, think about this when we deal with the Trinity, in a similar way, the one God created humanity through an expression of his plurality. That while God, we know, formed us male and female, that intimacy of plurality is then brought back into singleness through this idea of marriage. But, but in that, this, this needs to be the key understanding, I think. In that, we have to understand that this is a clue in casting the relationships of humanity with, with divinity. In other words, even though we are in the image of God, we are not God. And, and, and that has to be clear because back then there was this idea that humans could be God, humans were to worship, kings were gods, uh, priests were even gods, and, and they had this, this, this hierarchical system and all that stuff. And, and today you can have that in some countries, but here uh, that, that humans are never God. We are never to be worshipped. We are never to, to, to understand that, there, that, yes, we have the, the spark of the breath of life in us, but all that does is animate us. It does not bring us to be worshipped. And so in this, we, we have to sit and understand, of like, what is the role then of male and female if, if we're dealing with this idea of being in the image of God, and it takes both of them. Now, as we'll keep reading. And whatever the man called the, every living creature, that it was his name, verse 20, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. That, that, that's, that, that phrase, fit for him, is repeated. We just read it before. Something that's fit for him. 
So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and while he slept, took one of the ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. And, and the rib that the Lord God had taken for the man, he made into a woman and, and brought her into man. Then man said, this is, this is at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now, this morning, I, I know men's and women's roles in today's society, in today's church culture, I'm, I'm not going to touch on much post-fall, but I am going to say this. That in, in Genesis 1, it says that God created in the image of him, he created them, male and female, and he gave them dominion over what? Birds of the air, fish of the sea, and male over female. Did you catch that? And by the way, it's repeated over and over that dominion rulership was never given for one over the other at the origination of creation. That dominion, the relationship that was supposed to happen, and here, I'm going to get to it because I know we're grinding a little bit. You're Pastor Benji, are you touching the third rail? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about what's, I'm just talking about the text right now, sitting in this creation moment, that they were created equal to each other. That this idea, how do I know this? Well, let's, let's get into it. Here, Genesis 2, 18 and 23, and we're in this. We're in it right now. God said they're not there doesn't seem to be a helper fit for him. Verse 18, you guys see that. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, I'm gonna put a pin in that just for a second. And I wanna be clear of something, that the blessing that God has called Adam and Eve to, Noah to, Israel to, of being fruitful and multiplying, if you are single, or you're not married, or you're divorced, or you've lost your spouse, I just hold on till the end. Because sometimes we paint this ideal that if you are married you are, and being fruitful and multiplying, you are fulfilling the image of God, and if you are not, you are less than. And, we're, and, and by the way, the Old Testament stories are all about stories of people who can't have kids that God blesses anyways. And, and so I just, and Paul actually, Paul in the New Testament actually says, and he says, I'm writing this. Paul says, it's actually better to be single, he says. Paul may have been single himself, obviously, when he wrote that, because his wife would not have let him. But, but you see what I'm saying, where, where, where we, deli- we live in, especially, especially churches, if, if there's someone single, our job is to hook you up with someone who also is. We need to, we need to make sure we're helping you be fruitful and multiply. And, and I'm like, let's, let's sit in this to see why God was saying that. But, but here in Genesis, let's get back to this. God is looking, so for the original, we know God, God created Adam and Eve. But why, did Eve, why was Eve created? And here it says, I will make him a helper fit for him, right? A helper fit for him. And again, the word helper, it lacks, it lacks so much beauty. Because all of a sudden you're like, wait, no, see here, we have dominion entering. We have, we have Adam was taller than Eve, which, okay, yeah, 100%. Uh, no argument there. But, but physical characteristics do not equal dominionship. Because it said in Genesis 1, he created them to have dominion over everything else created. It didn't say he had dominion over each other. Not yet. We'll get to that. And, and, and so at the original plan of God was that he created them to be equal. And this word helper, I have on the screen... Did you know the word helper is easer? You don't have to know this. I'm going to tell you it, but you're not going to remember it. And, you know, I don't know why we do this sometimes, but we do. I'm going to tell you a Hebrew word. You're going to forget it, but please understand what this word means. That every other place in the Old Testament that the word helper is need, almost every other, I want to say almost because I want to be the caveat. When I did a, a word study search that I will say 99.9% just to leave for one may I missed, this helper is used of God for man. So we better not be saying the word helper is less than because God 
is greater than. And so this word helper, but I am poor and needy, hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. The word deliverer is the word helper. It's the word easer. O Lord, do not delay. Psalms 121, 1 to 2 says, I will lift up my eye to the hills. From where does my help come, my easer come? I'm, I'm looking for my easer. Psalms 121, 1 to 2 says, my easer comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. By the way, I think David is, is riffing off this idea that, that God is his easer, but remember, he, he hearkens back to the creation narrative to goes, I realize that this helper is the, the one opposite of me. And, and by the way, if you think there's just three of them, I can send you this list if you want. There's way more than three. There's Deuteronomy, there's, there's Psalms, there's Isaiah. Everyone come to shame through a people that do not profit them, that brings neither help nor profit. I will scatter them, Ezekiel says, God speaking, toward every wind all around him, his helpers and his troops. I will unsheathe the sword after them, talking about God. Hosea 13, 19 says, he destroys you. O Israel, God does. For you are against me. Against your what? Your easer, your helper. I'm going to destroy you because you're against me. And so this, this word easer is, 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 is something that I think we need to struggle with as we unpack this idea of being a helper. That, that woman was created for man to be an easer. And it's better, if you, if you translate it this way, not better, I think it's more helpful, rescuing ally. Because everywhere else it's used is dealing with a military of God coming to your rescue as your ally. And so as you watch and trace this word, Ezer, all the way through the Old Testament, you will find this idea of being fit, and that word fit is this idea of an opposite a mirror image that's a puzzle piece. One person said, a friend of mine says, it's a puzzle going together, making one again. That God, when he created male and female, and he took a rib, and there's so much there, and I don't have time to get into that this morning, that God's ultimate goal for this was that woman be man's rescuing ally. <laughs> Some of you who are married said amen out louder. Must be your anniversary. Um, but, but I want you to sit and meditate on that. Because the question then goes to, what is woman rescuing man from? It's she, from himself, some people said. The biblical narrative is trying to hint at it. Because all of a sudden, animals are being brought, and animals are told to be fruitful and to what? Multiply. Go back in your Bibles real quick to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 28. And it's the blessing of God that is not able, that is not able to be fulfilled yet without woman. Because here it is. Let me, let me fill it in. Blessed and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and to subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the every living thing that moves on the earth. And so God says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. And so when you go on to Genesis chapter 2, when you realize Adam is alone, it's not good for man to be alone. It is not just talking about just we're social creatures. But it's the fact that God has commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. And so man by himself is not able to be the full image bearer of God. Did you catch that? And by the way, woman by herself is not able to be bearer of the image of God by herself either. That is why scripture says when two, be, when, when two leave their father and mother, they shall become one. Why? It's going back to Genesis chapter 1 where it says God created Man, one, in his image, male and female, he created them. Did you catch that? That God, through his mystery, as this story is being told, is saying that our goal then, mankind's goal, its mission, 
was to have dominion and to be fruitful and multiply. And those two things cannot happen without the other. In fact, one writer puts it this way, and let me read it. One writer says this, Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him. Let us leave our tools out. Uh, She was not to control him as the head, nor, and hear this, come on church, hear this, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal. From the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve were to be equals. And so what has happened that we begin to see in the biblical narratives this? And you can go to Genesis chapter 3 for that. Where the ideal got broken. And from that ideal is this. Stay with me here. Genesis chapter 3, the very, spoiler alert if you didn't know this, <laughs> Adam and Eve, once they were created, messed up. Eve took of the fruit, she ate of it, she was deceived. The Bible says, Paul, Old New Testament refers to that. Adam gets brought by Eve, this fruit, and he partakes of it. Both of them failed to be image bearers of God. And, and oh, by the way, just a side note, this is for free. Why I know we are not to be like God is just at the end of Genesis 3, it says, verse 22, then Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. In other words, even though we are created in his image, there are some things that God never intended for us to partake of. Because he knew if we did, this would happen. And so the rest of the biblical narrative is trying to get back to that which was created in the image of God, male and female together, ruling over God's creation because God wanted intimacy with a creation made in his image. And we were to be his image to the world and to the universe. That's what makes us male and female special is we bear his image, but we are never him. Here, back Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve realized they are, and all we're gonna study that part too, but I'm, I'm gonna get to one part. Verse 16, and I, I want you to catch this. These are consequences of sin, which by the way, has God been trying to fix the consequences of sin from the foundation of the earth? Yes, he has. So please understand, as I read this, I come from a space that understands that it's God's ultimate will. And by the way, you see this in Paul's writings. You see this in in the Old Testament where they're trying to, to fix the brokenness of this relationship between male and female because the whole time from here on, from sin after, there is a brokenness that happens. Here it says, because you have listened. No, to the woman he says, I will surely multiply your your what? Your, your pain. King James nails this, by the way. The rest of them, we fall short. King James says, I will, I will surely multiply your pain in conception. That actually is the right one. So it's, 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 I will surely multiply your pain in conception. In your pain, you shall bring forth children. See, see, what happened was God said to Adam and Eve, when he made them in the image of God, he says, I want you to be fruitful. He blessed them. He blessed them with the ability to be fruitful and to multiply. And all of a sudden, because of sin, the ability to be fruitful and multiply is broken. It says now there will be pain in even having kids. By the way, read the Old Testament story of all the, the matriarchs of the Bible having difficulty having kids, that's an echo back to this fall. That's an echo back to the consequence of that fall, that it wasn't just pain in giving birth, it was pain in even conceiving, because while God originally intended for you to be fruitful and multiply and to have dominion over it, the fall cost the ability. And so whenever you see Israel being fruitful and multiply and filling the earth, it's God going back to the original Eden state and putting his hand of covering over him and them. And so at every point, 
you have a child. It's God putting your hand of blessing over something that's broken. Keep reading. It says, in pain you shall be informed. Your desire shall be for or contrary, depending on your translation, to your husband. But he shall rule over you. All of a sudden, introduced into the biblical narrative is a consequence of sin. That as Paul says it, husband, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Love each other. Paul is trying to fix the brokenness that enters when selfishness enters the picture. God, it's the snake you created. God, it's the woman you gave me. And here it is. We're going to wrap, up the, wrap it up here. That while the relationship has consequences, I don't believe these consequences are permanent. That God's ultimate will is to bring unity back to a husband and wife. That one shouldn't have dominion over each. That two becoming one is what the Bible's ultimate ideal is. Now, for those of you that are single or, or, or not married or, or whatever, I want you to understand that we're under a new covenant. And while yet we, we still can be fruitful and multiply, as some of you have found out, the command by Jesus when he leaves is Matthew 28. We're to be fruitful and multiply in a different way now. Paul has this on his brain. Jesus has this on the idea. The new fruitful and multiplication is going into the whole world and preaching the gospel. That no longer do we need a people group to proclaim his message, to be image bearers. God has that. Now we need to go and tell those who have forgotten that they are made in the image of their creator, that their creator came and died, and that the kingdom of God is now. That is the new blessing of being fruitful and multiply. That is the new call of us together, male and female, that we are to go and be fruitful and multiply, grow the church. Paul says it this way, Christ is the cornerstone. God is building up a dwelling place for himself of saints that are coming to Jesus through others telling and being fruitful and multiplying. That is the new call. So if you're single, divorced, uh, uh, if you're widowed, it doesn't matter. You are not less than. You, and, and if you're married and, and, and your spouse is demeaning or, or, or overpowering of you, that doesn't matter because you are called into the family of God and that you are made in the image of God. And because of that, that's what brings value and nothing else. That even though there are Trust me, none of the original roles had to do with one greater or lesser than the other. To be created in the image is to have both aspects present to fulfill, fulfill the divine command. A, woman, a man cannot give birth to a child. The end, amen, someone says, like, that the end. That, hallelujah, says another man. I, I, I just need you to understand that it takes both of us to fulfill the divine command. And while we may have roles to play, hear me, none of them are dominion roles. That that is a consequence of sin. And God is trying to get back to the idea that there is neither male nor female, free nor slave, Jew nor Gentile, we are called to be created in his image, and we are that, and we are now his image bearers. Moving on. That yes, there are roles to play, but don't kid yourself if you think the ultimate ideal isn't this. The 
You see, we're the, we're the little one. And God's the big one. We're never going to be the big G. We're always going to be the little, not G, image bearer of God. And God is looking to reach down and reconnect with you, his image bearer, because he needs you to carry his name to all the world. The divine command today is be fruitful and multiply, but not in that way. You can be. But it's to go into all the world and tell the good news that what you are is because of what God made you be. And he wants to he wants to dwell with you. He wants to walk along in the garden with you. Because that is what he created you, male and female, to do. To dwell in his presence forever. Church family, meditate on that. Father God, it says in scripture that we are created in his image, in your image. And while we do not want to be arrogant about that, and we don't fully understand why, we are David, why, why have you done this? Scripture is full of instances where you are desiring intimacy with your creation that is made in your image. And so, Lord, whatever that means for each one of us sitting here as we meditate, what, what does that mean for me to be made in your image and for the person across from me to be made in your image? That it's going to take all of us, both of us, to fulfill God's mission of going to all the world and telling them about you. So, Lord, that, that's a huge task. So maybe just help us today go next door and tell someone that they are made in the image of God. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord have his face shine upon you and give you peace. Happy Sabbath, church family.